Welcome everybody to part two of our panel discussion in conjunction with the Fact of Fiction, four works by Kara Walker on view at the Visual Arts Center at UT Austin until November 20th. Um, we have a lot of questions here for our panelists, Valerie Castle Oliver, Hamza Walker, and Stephanie Sparling Williams. And so I say we just get started and jump right into them. Everybody ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the first question we have from our audience uh, that we weren't able to get to during our um, incredible discussion last time is, has Kara Walker been influenced positively or negatively by the films of Lottie Renninger? Uh, it's, it's, it's funny, I can answer that, that question. Um, it, it, well, first of all, there, there's an assumption on the part of the person asking the question. <laughs> like, is she, first of all, familiar with the films of La Terrania, which she is? Um, I gave Kara a book on La Terrania's films, uh, must be maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, one that I'd seen, it was a, an all black, beautiful hardcover publication that came out uh, maybe seven, eight, eight years ago um, that I brought to her. And at the time, she had mentioned knowing, having heard of Lotte Reininger, but uh, in terms of cut paper silhouette, there was a whole, there was already, you know, enough um, uh, uh, Reininger, it, 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 her knowledge of Reininger is much late in the game, much later in the game. Um, uh, uh, so um, in terms of positively or negatively, uh, she, independent of Lotte Reininger, uh, despite whatever parallels are there, um, uh, Kara came up with her, you know, her own aesthetic bag of tricks, uh, independent of Reininger, um, despite the incredible confluence uh, between the two. But she's wholly familiar with Reininger at this point, def definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I just think it's interesting that artists tap into a sort of larger zeitgeist, uh, whether it's um, happening simultaneously or whether it happens across time. Um, that sort of motion uh, with silhouette and puppetry, I mean, it has so many different manifestations in different cultures. Um, that um, as, but as Hamza has stated, you know, the, the confluence in terms of the subject matter is, is you know, uh, not necessarily subject matter of American history or the antebellum South, but, you know, the idea of how these characters function in terms of sort of uh, interpersonal, um, you know, spaces within each other is, is a bit uncanny. It's interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, if there were the biggest amount of confluence, I would say between Reiniger and, and Kara is actually in her, in the installations with the color backdrop that she does with color lighting gels and then superimposes the silhouettes. But in terms of animation, mm -hmm. I think it's a stark departure, right? right? I mean, where, where's one would, 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 would expect her to, to, uh, uh, follow a relatively straightforward um, trajectory in terms of animating the characters. Instead, she goes much more towards like, you know, a ver the crude, you know, DIY kind of, you know, Indonesian shadow puppet theater. Right, where you mode, see the mechanics. Which, yeah, 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 the with the whole thing, which is completely right. right. And despite the layers behind it, um, uh, so I'd say that there's a there's a marked difference between their 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 styles in terms of animation, but there's a huge confluence in terms of certain installations of Kara's and Reininger's, you know, Reininger's aesthetic. At the same time, there's also, uh, I mean, maybe 20 years ago, maybe when William Kentridge was doing cut was doing he was doing the shadow the, the or the black paper silhouette work, but he was tearing his edges on his characters. It gave it beautiful works, you know, but gave it, and despite the immediate comparison, they also, you know, um, uh, you know, you compare sometimes for the sake of highlighting the contrast, the difference, you know. Well, and, and also with Kentridge too, you know, it's also the um, 
inserting the drawings in the spaces of erasure that happen. So it's not purely just the puppetry. It has mm -hmm. also intersplice within the, the orb of the of the narratives. And there are often, you know, long trajectories of stories that are yeah. presented rather than the vignettes that um, Kara will sometimes present that he also sort of inserts the drawings. And so the act of building and um, um, the constructing the, the drawn image is even more uh, pronounced given the sort of back and forth between the silhouette and the puppetry and the movement with the, mo uh, with the torn paper mm -hmm. uh, and then the actions on the actual substrate of paper, you know, that's um, that I think kind of highlights or gives it even more, a, a kind of more animated feel, more dynamism, you know, to it, um, more so than you would expect what drawing is about, you know, drawing becoming action, which is very much what Caro's done. She's drawn and cut out these silhouettes and then she is animating them and breathing life into them and breathing life into these narratives, fact or fiction. <laughs> Back to fiction. And I don't have anything to add on this question other than I'm kind of hung up a little bit on the question itself, what a negative, what negative influence might actually be on an like on an artist's work, but I think specifically thinking about the complexity of this body of work that um, Landmarks is exhibiting, you know, what are positive and negative influences, like what might we pinpoint, you know, um, and I don't have the answer to that. I just, I mean, you know, I think this question of influence is so important. And Valerie and Hans have done such a great job of making those connections, but I just wonder, you know, how to evaluate um, or how, I, how might we evaluate um, how influence is positive or negative? Yeah. Mm. It's funny, I guess it, it, it's, it's um, what I think about the, the issue of negative influence, right? <laughs> it's, um, uh, uh, somebody like Donald Judd's relationship to, to John Chamberlain, right? Who, huge influence, but what's the best part is that, you know, he wrote about John Chamberlain, but then he looks at John Chamberlain and everything John Chamberlain is an abstract expression is doing metal and decides, I'm gonna run the opposite way. Like he's like, no, 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 no. I'm going right? Yeah, you've done that, right? <laughs> I don't have to do that. You took care of that for me, right? So the exploration in that is not what I'll leave to you. I will go and make, wholly different, you know, right. kinds of abstract metal, you know, painted sculptures. But I find that a very, very beautiful relationship. Well, and there's always the a relationship. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Oh, no, I was just saying it's a, it's a narrative of departure, too, and how that Right, happens. right, right. The negative being, like, I'm running this way, but I need you <laughs> to tell me what direction to go in. Exactly. And there's always this sort of enactment of patricide or, or matricide, you know, where you almost have to kill the father. You almost have to kill the mother in, other, in, in order to exist, to become sort of your own person. And I, but I think that is that happens throughout the whole history of painting or art making or, or creating. You know, you, you're always unduly influenced by someone like I think of um, maybe it's not necessarily the death of but I think of someone like mm -hmm. Angel Otero and how he will embrace the works by Poisson or you know Velasquez but he also destroys them too like he can paint, paint them almost mark for mark but then he disrupts that whole image he literally destroys it uh, through the act of peeling and moving the the sort of paint once it's congealed to a certain texture, literally moving it around to completely obscure and obliterate the image. Um, but you feel the presence, you feel the residual of, of his love for that painter, but it's almost like having to kill them to exist and to move beyond. Right. Really, and um... On that note, I guess we can move to talking about killing. I've never seen Lovecraft Country, but I understand it's a horror <laughs> show. So one of you can give a description of the show. Um, after I ask the question, can the panel respond to Walker's video works in the context of Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country and other contemporary works of inversion and reclamation in terms of how these forces impact 
and inform popular culture. I hope that was clear. And I hope one of you have watched that show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't make it past episode two. I'm not. Oh, really? You know, so I'm, no, I can't. It's too, too, too wacky. Or I'm, I mean, at a certain point, I'm either it's too wacky or I'm too old. Um, or, you know, some gray line, or, you know, between the yeah, no, okay. right, like a mixture. I'm joking. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, as far as the just um, kind of wacky postmodern bricolage um, of wanting to have a certain kind of gravitas about the Jim Crow era and the trials and tribulations suffered under the Jim Crow era and you know the Green Book and Lovecraft and 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 then suddenly throwing in scenes, you know, the music from the Jeffersons, you know, or you know, then quotes from Baldwin, you know, and so but it's it's sometimes I think, you know, you 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 mix those things, you mix those genres at your at your at your own peril. Um, but the, the, you know, so I don't see um, too much direct relationship between Lovecraft Country and, and uh, Carol Walker's work, um, you know, but in terms of the second part, just in general, in terms of inversion and reclamation, and I don't know if I would, I would um, uh, put it in terms of uh, impact or influence as much as uh, 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 things working. This perhaps being a moment, right, where where a number of things can can um, uh, can bloom um, without one thing, you know, something being begat from something else or along along those lines. You know, even though I do think of Kara as a very strong generational statement. You know, in a lot of a lot of respects, but I think the that does forecast a uh, a certain kind of freedom generationally from you know, say the elders, you know, a Howard Dean Pendel, a Betty Czar, you know. So in terms of that controversy, but that Kara does represent a kind of a watershed moment or a kind of break. Uh, with respect to how she was handling a certain kind of subject matter, but that has since um, uh, that uh, uh, you know I feel like that kind of freedom or permission to engage with the subject matter, whether it's the antebellum South or Jim Crow era segregation, you know, um, as as far as the the raw material for the imagination, you know, uh, that you know Kara kicked that off. Right, and uh, you know, but just for audiences too, you know, understanding how, how maybe because, well, how do I, how do I state this? It is that permissiveness to not be bound to the reverence of a moment, to not be uh, frivolous or um, ironic or uh, to challenge um, the ideas of what that that era may have looked like or what it had stated to have been uh, for the people who lived in it. So it's this real, you know, and I think a lot of people can um, find those parallels with the Holocaust, right? You know, and that mm -hmm. for many, a, a moon, many decades, people held that atrocity, that space of atrocity with deep reverence and any, any attempt to be uh, comical about it, any attempt to be frivolous about it was seen as an act of betrayal, cultural, social, you know, political betrayal. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and yet there are artists who are now looking at it with a different lens because they're so, there's such a, there's a generational divide as Hamza has stated, but there's also just a way of looking at trauma. Like how do you look at trauma and derive something um, from it that um, is not just re, 
enforcing concepts around trauma? Like how do you liberate yourself from discussing this uh, without lumping it all as to one monolithic experience? Because we know as horrific, I mean, and that, that is an atrocity, chattel slavery is an atrocity. And I say is because it's still going. There are spaces where there's still chattels. Well, not maybe not chattel slavery, but enslavement of other humans. Um, and so um, to somehow try to get on the other side of it, um, to sort of begin to unravel the sort of monolith that it has become is fraught, you know, and to have the courage to say, I want to look at the, you know, um, the sexuality, you know, and how that impedes, but not just from this long lens. Let's get up close, you know, let's, let's see, let's imagine the narratives that we never hear. Let's um, take the facts that we know and elongate them and, you know, uh, impregnate them you know, with, with different uh, sensibility that um, reinforces a kind of trauma, but then also uh, reinforces a space of absurdity to it. Um, and maybe reinforcement is not the word, but, but opens a space for absurdity to, to enter into the conversation, which is, you know, for many people still, that's a very taboo subject matter. Um, and it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of, um, it takes a sense of self <laughs> to be able to wade into the crocodile alligator infested waters <laughs> of the antebellum South mm -hmm. and uh, come out unscathed, you know, you're gonna have some scars from it, you know, um, but you also open the possibilities, the eight possible beginnings, you open so many possibilities of what, um, that journey would and could or had looked like um, for people um, who may have lived it if it were in fact the characters that inhabit her vignettes and her films. I really like this question um, because and I also, I just wanted to say, I have not caught up on the whole series because it is dealing with trauma. I mean, in, in a similar way that I feel like a lot of Kara Walker's works, I need to be in a certain headspace where I need to have a kind of emotional bandwidth to, um, to really um, engage with. This is one of those shows where I too, like Hanzo watched the first two and I was like, oh my God, um, this is, you know, this is intense. And I wanted to just to answer Kenitra's question um, that for those of you in the audience who have not seen Lovecraft Country, um, the series follows this young black man um, who's traveling with friends um, across the South in the 1950s. And he's searching for his missing father. Um, and then he kind of encounters um, this horror, um, world and that's where the Lovecraft comes in where it's um, you know Lovecraft um, is this location that he finds himself is apparently the location that Howard Lovecraft um, kind of created his mythos in you know in the horror in his own horror moment and so and so full disclosure I don't know all of the all, all of the things that have happened. But I do think what's very interesting um, and how there's some connections that I see that the person who asked this question is making between Carrie Walker's work is this idea of racism as horror, you know, and, uh, and thinking about ways to bring that reality to contemporary um, viewers. And I think it's all of the things that Hamza and Valerie have, you know, articulated in terms of a forerunner and, you know, an opening up space to um, to address perhaps a taboo moment or a taboo set of topics. Um, but for me, and I think as a Black woman watching this show, part of why, and I think part of the film and the point and the success is that the horror is actually, and what we're recognizing as the horror of racism is so real and so traumatizing um, that we recognize it as such, um, even when the genre changes, right? So no less traumatizing as Harriet, no less traumatizing as Selma, no less traumatizing as, you know, um, 12 Years a Slave. Um, but I think that the genre of horror is a very particular, um, 
has a very set a, a very particular set of tools that um, make the experience legible in ways that I think um, Kara Walker's work um, also is working within a set of tools that are, are that creating different spaces of legibility um, or in similar ways. So I agree like with Hamza too that it, it is perhaps a little bit of a stretch thinking about time and medium and maybe generation, but I do see that these are similar um, in perhaps parallel trajectories um, in the effects that they create in our viewing bodies, um, which I think is just something interesting to think about. And I also want to, um, you know, think about, again, I'm not a horror person, but, um, and I, I can't watch many films and mummy, like, you know, that kind of thing is not my thing, but I do find it interesting that um, this mythos that love um, that um, that Lovecraft created is particular is specifically concerned with this idea of reality and this this tension between um, realities, you know, and how people experience realities that are um, outside of their own, if that makes sense. Which mm -hmm. now, when I think about white audiences and I think about, you know, early controversies around Carol Walker's work, I think part of the early controversies were really about who was looking, right? And we talked a little bit about this in the last session, but really this concern, this hyper-awareness of who was witnessing the these acts, right? Who was witnessing these narratives and what they were taking away from it. And I think in the same way that um, Lovecraft was really interested in people experiencing realities outside of their own or their, these, this other realm, um, I think Lovecraft in that way and Kara Walker's work in that way offers for white viewers in particular an entry point into the horrors that it, the horror that is racism, right? In this way that um, like I think, like I was saying, has has so much to do with visual literacy, but how we come to understand and learn these histories through um, the visual. So I just, I like I said, I'm I don't know much about this this um, show other than it's terrifying and effective, and I hope maybe I can get through it. But I do think that there's some interesting, you know, some parallels happening in in both Kara Walker's work and this contemporary um, text. Well, I, I love that, Stephanie, and, and you're right. It was, whereas certain communities would turn away from what Caro was doing, others were looking and consuming, and, and that was it. It was like the space of consumption, you know, um, and the gaze, and who is the gaze being created for was a fundamental, you know, um, premise in the Carol Walker, yes, Carol Walker, no, uh, book, which came out, which uh, was really about, you know, when and where can we be safe to talk about these, these traumas that happen? Generally, we have our circles, right? And we have our circles of safety in which these things can be discussed, but they've never been discussed because they're too horrific um, to begin to unravel in a way. You know, it's like um, Gwen DeBose Shaw's uh, book, um, you know, uh, Seeing the Unspeakable, you know, um, and it is, you know, Kara Walker elucidating the unspeakable, the, the horrors, because it's something that is yet to be uttered. But the other thing that I love, and I and I full disclosure have never seen Lovecraft Country, <laughs> but um, there's been so much talk about it. One of the things I find interesting is utilizing the South as a character. You know that the South, the land itself, becomes such a character. And when you think about, you know, areas around mysticism, you know what the land holds within it what it contains, it contains the trauma. You know, um, I, there was this beautiful book I read about Gabriel Prosser um, uh, and um, he was saying, um, it had been born into slavery and, and the statement was that, that at times when uh, people would attempt to run away and they were captured, um, they were tied to trees and whipped, but that people, uh, who were being whipped would speak their spirits into the trees. So as the spirit not to be traumatized by the physical experience. And they would go back and forth to take their spirits back. 
like that whole like what the landscape holds in terms of the untold stories, the untapped stories. Um, that exists within the land. It's like, as you say, Stephanie, it's not just the racism that exists in the interpersonal, the dynamics between individuals, but what the land holds as a space of trauma and horror that may have taken place. So I get the sense that just like the Blair Witchcraft Project, you just feel like there are spirits in the space, you know, and whether that feeds into the narrative of this, of this series. That's, that's profound. Thank you. Um, what was the book name? By the way, we can edit it's this Gabriel out. Flosser, um, who was uh, enslaved here in Richmond, but he has his whole narrative um, around his experiences as an enslaved person. Hmm. I mean, just on a quick note, it's interesting with Lovecraft Country that it starts, and I obviously haven't gone very far in, uh, but uh, and I think that it's the beginning of the notion of a haunting by a former slave, which is where I left off. I think that was either episode two, late in episode two, or maybe episode three, I waited in. Um, but the beginning in terms of horror, is, at least in terms of its beginning, is less related to the landscape and more just the notion of travel. Hmm. The, 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 so the idea of sundown towns, where would you be safe uh, being chased from one place to another place? Which I found interesting that it's, it's just, so it's, it's something, so the, 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 one of the characters is the editor of the Green Book. Um, uh, and is it Vic, Vic, is the original editor of the Green Book, Victor Green? Um, uh, original there's a character who plays I have the, the, the editor of the Green Book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, but horror as it's found in the quotidian, right? So I think something, what would make it horrific, especially to a viewership today, is some the idea of, you know, imagine, you know, something that we take for granted, like a road trip, for example, right? And then that being the source of a potential series of horrific events, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's, it's it isn't, which is, which is uh, quite a beautiful conceit of the show. I don't know, you know, I, I'm not, I didn't enjoy all the execution of it, but the idea, the framework for combining Lovecraft and the Green Book, and, and especially with Lovecraft, the idea of finding the, something horrible in the everyday, as opposed mm -hmm. to then it gets into ghouls and monsters or wherever it wants to go. Right. The other thing that I would make note of in terms of, uh, it, it isn't so much Lovecraft country, I think a more, perhaps telling thing would be um, Quentin Tarantino, Django, right? I'd Django say, and uh, Chain. <laughs> yeah, Django and Chain, you know, where, where what, what, uh, for all of the, the, the perhaps incorrectness, I don't know, of that, of that comparison, I don't think it's in, 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 in incorrect. Um, uh, uh, but in terms of another, uh, uh, you know, you brought up the Holocaust, Valerie, the idea of comedy and slavery, horror and slavery, right? right you know, um, uh, putting slavery in these different filmic genres, but the Western, right, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that that played itself out. Um, and I think that was obviously, you know, Django Unchained under, um, that was during Obama's, you know, presidency. But I think Jamie Foxx, Right after he played Django, a slave, I think his next role was actually as president <laughs> with um, Gerard Byrne in a movie. And I actually made a point to watch the two of those back to back, which I thought was really quite hysterical. The idea of Jamie Foxx going from, you know, a former slave in one movie to then in the very next movie being president of the United States. But isn't that what happened? Follow up, Jamie <laughs> But it, was a, it, wasn't, it wasn't Olympus has fallen, but it was one of those, you know, the president, the White House is sieged by terrorists. Jamie Foxx is the president and Gerard Byrne is the on security detail and has to 
Is it, but, sure. but why why is it when we have a president suddenly the White House is under siege? What's up with that? Oh well, no, I think that the genre of the White House is under siege is any president. But, yeah. you know, I was also thinking too, because Tarantino is such a lover of 70s movies, right? I mean, his whole thing is about giving homage. And you know, thinking about Mandingo, you know, Mandingo. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. So, yeah, completely, <laughs> completely. So in, in part, it is genre farce, right? Like, exactly, so, exactly. Right. But so asking him- the 70s, it is- Totally. It, so it, so it even asking the idea of, right, self-determination, right. It's like to ask, like, so as pissed off as Spike Lee might be about whatever moves Quentin Tarantino makes, but it's like, what authorized Quentin Tarantino to do this? And in some sense, Quentin Tarantino can point to Mandingo. Like, just throw his hands in there. Like. But it's interesting. These are all interesting points, uh, ways of entry into this topic of what you were talking about, the horrors of racism. I mean, Stephanie was saying horror could be a genre as an entry point. You're saying that, you know, Tarantino and humor, this could be an entry point into it. And that actually brings me to a question on that from one of the um, viewers that said, can you speak about macabre humor in Kara Walker's work? For example, burning African village playset with big house and lynching and work of hers, I guess from, two, from 2016, like her exploration of the erotic, I believe it's definitely a question of perception and who's viewing the piece. For example, what cultural historical context they are able to bring to the encounter. So I guess there, there, this question about humor in the work, um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you, let's explore that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You want to kick it off, Stephanie? <laughs> <laughs> um, no pressure. Yes, sure, you yeah, had no pressure. Uh, <laughs> um, sure, I, I guess mm, in terms of humor, I don't, I don't, I guess I just don't experience the work that way. Um, and so, and I understand the ways that the character, um, you know, the caricatures are engaged in a whole host of acts that might appear funny, but I believe to their point, and I think they say, you know, dependent on who's viewing this piece, what cultural context they're coming at this from, that is the work, right? That's their 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 reactions to, um, especially I think to the video works become what the work is also about, the ways that racism is exposed in your own um, kind of frame of reference. I I struggled with this one. I don't, I don't find the work very, humorous um but i wonder the the idea of you know macabre like this idea that something's unpleasant um that might make someone uncomfortable um or uncomfortable use of violence or visual cues that might create um yeah that discomfort i'm gonna just i'm gonna bow out of this one because i just <laughs> to me, I, I i guess i just don't see the see it in the one in the examples that they bring up however i do agree that it is part of who's viewing the work and their experiences of the work um just like adrian piper's you know corner which i think i brought up in the first um the first iteration was that part of it was how you were feeling. And she drew attention to that. Um, I also think she um, does this very well in um, aspects of the liberal dilemma, which has been on view um, with at Blues for Smoke with and very near to Kara Walker's work, um, where she's, you're looking at this work of black men descending a staircase. And there's this sound, this voiceover that's talking to you about how you're perceiving them as you're looking. And I think that to me is, it is perhaps connected to this idea of whether or not someone might feel the work is containing humor in a certain way. Um, I think Kara Walker speaks to humor very well um, in her recent work, especially um, around some of the videos that she created for Tate, um, you know, for Fawns Americanas. She talks about how things, um, how she's thinking about humor and joy too. So that might be for the viewer who watches this, that might be also a place to start with the artist. Well, I, I don't see humor as much as I see absurdity. 
and and maybe that's in in that space of absurdity one can glean humor certainly her her sort of tongue in cheek not so much tongue in cheek because i think she's very explicit about um this the sort of the the absurdity of what of what these actions are the fact that you can impregnate a man by inserting you know a, a ball of cotton in his anus you know and making him pregnant with with all of these cotton babies that come out and sing you know it it, it is the absurdity but sometimes people turn to humor sometimes people turn to absurdity to to really create some sort of incantation, incantation? Am, I, am, I, am I saying that right? Incantation. Or it's like humor is the stress reaction or the- Exactly, that, you know, to deal with the space of, you know, trauma or to deal with, um, I mean, in many ways, what we've seen throughout history is taking, um, understanding the, the, insanity that is racism. It is, some people have really categorized it as a mental disease. And um, looking at that, it's always within that space that one is able to craft or see clearly um, a response, the survival, you know, it's a survivalist strategy. It's, it's, a, it's a strategy to survive the absurdity of it all. And how does one make sense of it? I mean, you could look at the work of Richard Pryor, you know, you could look at any number of conversations that, that comedians bring to the fore that exposes the reality of the life that we live, but also the absolute absurdity of, of the moment too, you know? So it's kind of this duality. and. I guess if you were looking toward humor, I think it would be to see it in the absurdity of the work. Like if you, um, her, uh, a subtlety, you know, I mean, that is, you know, it's not tongue in cheek, but it's, it, there is, you know, think about sugar and sugar and the role of sugar in the enslavement, you know, in the slave trade and in the enslavement of black bodies. And yet you have a sphinx, which, you know, really connects the continent in a different kind of way, right? But you have the sphinx of the mammy who holds within herself the, the secrets, all of the secrets of the antebellum South, right? And not only do we, are, are we faced with the, the absolute largesse and the monumentality of this Sphinx created of sugar, you know, the, the molasses babies, the sugar babies that are literally um, disintegrating with the humidity and the heat. And then the interface, how people interface with this sculpture. And that is the telling point, right? That is showing us to ourselves, allowing us to see ourselves and the what we bring to the table as various communities, right? Because they're how people interface with that sculpture. And I believe she recorded their, their uh, responses, you know, all of the people and what their fixations were. Were there fixations with the genitalia of the sculpture? Because a lot of people were very fixated on that, you know? Uh, and what does that say about the psycho um, sexual um, headspace that has a lot to do with race? That we are, there are still subjects even today that we are still grappling with because there's been no real reconciliation well, what does that mean of being fascinated with the other? The whole concept of lore and loathing is still very much at play in our society. Uh, we are afraid and we're more siloed than we've ever been, even though we live in this very, this country where there's constant movement and there's international movement. We still are still woefully suspicious and unfamiliar with each other. And, and that psychosexual thing is very much at play. Um, pornography, you know, and 
the absurdity and sometimes humor of pornography. Not all sex is, is serious, you know, so sex can be funny. Uh, it can be challenging. It can be interesting. Uh, but, you know, never do we think about sex as funny, but some of this stuff is really funny. So, you know, even in porn, you know, just the absurdity of the stories, you know, oh, my dishwasher broke, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just wearing this low cut negligee to let in the repairman. I mean, it's like, what do you expect is going to happen, right? I mean, it is inevitable. <laughs> so, right. You know, but it is, but even though you see that and then you think about, you know, Jerry Falwell Jr. and Liberty University and the fact that this relationship happened with of all places in Miami with a young, you know, Cuban pool boy, you know, I mean, you can't make it up. I mean, the absurdity is there, right? I mean, so, and it's also speaking to this psychosexual concept that, Oh, he wasn't a participant. He only liked to watch. It's like, well, okay, where do we go with this? We are still spinning our wheels in this, this whole realm. It's still about the luring and the taboo of the other. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's still very much present in our real contemporary lives. Um, well, absolutely. Um because that actually brings up another question that one of the viewers had, which was, you know, she creates this visual imagery that's centered uncomfortably around um, scenes of depraved, this person says, sex and violence. So they want you all to talk about how does she do this without tipping over into voyeurism, which is, I think, what you were getting to already right there. Hamza, it's all you. No, Hamza, yeah. <laughs> well, I go back. I mean, I, if I could take a step back before getting to depravity, to go back to humor, um, and I do agree that that the, the relationship between the, the you know the, the, they can I think they can be funny, they can, they are also absurd um, that there actually is and, and, and I mean, however she might muster it, is the pathos in the world, hmm. um, but I think it's it's the issue of humor and the issue of the stereotype. So I think that there was, when I go back to the initial responses to the work um, and seeing in it the stock repertoire of stereotypical, stereotype characters, the Topsy, the Piccaninny, the Mammy, uh, Uncle Remus, um, and the way that she was deploying them right, towards these absurdist and sometimes humorous ends. Um, but when it comes to humor, and specifically that question, Stephanie, about who is looking at this work, um, when I think about uh, something like the Chitlin Circuit, um, and a space in which uh, a black comedian, all black audience, the ability for us to laugh at ourselves, right? And that is laughing at ourselves uh, in spite of uh, or alongside of uh, uh, having been made fun of, right? Uh, by not having control over images or representations of ourselves, right? So is there a space in which does that, in which folly, right? In which we can make fun of ourselves, right? Or, and can we make fun of ourselves in front of white people, right? So I remember growing up and um, there was a real, uh, before Richard Pryor, there was Red Fox. So of as part <laughs> of part of watching Sanford and Son was the show already had its you know for, you know it it, it 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 it's 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 virtues it's qualities it's funny but the real thing was my parents just watching the show in utter disbelief that Red Fox could actually have a show on NBC the prime uh, time that he so wasn't he was somebody <laughs> who was so X rated <laughs> that it was just like the idea of him even it's like. Oh my God, the idea of him appearing on a major network television 
like cleaning up Red Fox. So, well, didn't he have a didn't he have an album that was Triple X or something? Oh yeah. Like that? Oh, he, I mean Red Fox. Yeah, I mean raunchy and as body as they come, but that but that idea about uh, you know laughing at ourselves amongst ourselves laughing at ourselves in front of white people can that same folly be expressed right which is the same thing about richard Pryor. you know i would say about you know that nigger's crazy bicentennial nigger what those records which i grew up with in the house were you know did white people listen to those records and they did right oh, yeah. <laughs> so <It's obvious>. the <laughs> whole, yeah but the whole idea about folly right, and, and Jewish humor, right, uh, which of course is, I mean, responsible for the sitcom as we know it, right. um, that, 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 uh, uh, what, in humor in that regard is a negotiation. And I would say what Richard Pryor was asking of an audience was, you know, to laugh at a Richard Pryor joke if one is white, is one in fact declaring themselves to be the nigger in the Richard Pryor joke. In other words, Richard Pryor, if Richard Pryor is saying it's not, we're all the nigger now, right? Which is I think part of Richard Pryor's brilliance about a certain transference, right? As volatile as that statement is, I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, uh, but I think that that's part of the brilliance of the work and the humor, right? Is the nature, the nature of the body, right? So, but who is looking at it again? Like, who can laugh about what in front of whom? You know, being a real key point. So, but on to the thing about depravity, um, I'd mentioned, I think, towards the end of the session before, just about the, um, uh, the sex and violence, uh, but the, the, the issue about shame and shame and the lack thereof and shamelessness, um, that there's another dimension where, and Stephanie brought the issue about who the, the viewing the work. And I think the issue, what makes the work really brilliant, at least the, you know, the silhouettes, was a, cons a preoccupation with whether or not there is uh, 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 black audiences being uh, somewhat ashamed of Kara's work because of the white viewership, right? As, the, as producing some kind of tension. But what makes the work really brilliant is that the characters in Kara Walker's work don't give a rat's ass about the audience. They never address the audience. They're moving back and forth laterally across the wall. There is no Z axis. They don't stare back out at the audience. They, they aren't even aware. They're in their own Looney Tunes universe of fellatio and shit, right? And bludgeoning. So I think that what they, so in terms of like the uncomfortable, the effect, and it's all an effect that we produce socially as viewers, but it is not an effect or a product, like as though the characters in the artwork, they're shameless, you know, in their, their behavior. But just the issue about, you know, uh, uh, a doubling down on, on shame and shamelessness, right? So power, relations, pleasure, uh, sex, and violence, that old chestnut in terms of relationship. Um, uh, the anus, the mouth, um, the these in, in terms of a Freudian dynamic around those things, right? The shame about reproduction and defecation, um, uh, pissing, shitting, their nearness to um, sexual organs, right? So sex and shame going together. So I think it's a whole loaded, you know, it's a whole, and it's, it's, and it's playfully played out, right? In a Looney Tunes way. So I don't think it invites the same kind of voyeurism that the pornographic that Valerie was getting at as much as these vignettes. But I, I, I wanted to go back to questions around humor because what's interesting to me is as much as minstrelsy as is framed as us mimicking ourselves, the reality is oftentimes black people were mimicking white people, mimicking black people. Right. So it was this weird kind of circularity where, you know, I, I, you know, minstrelsy 
sort of emerged as white people mimicking black people and then black people mimicking white people mimicking black people. So it's this very bizarre, um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? It's beyond uh, this space of mimicry. It's, it's almost like we are appropriating um, and repositioning the sort of absurdity of you looking at us through a lens of absurdity. This is not who we are, you know, this is your, this is your perception, right. your ideas about blackness, right. you know, that we can hand back to you to show you the absolute absurdity of your perception and get paid for it as well. So, you know, there was never an understanding of oneself. There was almost an empowerment to mimic. Like the cakewalk was all about mimicking, you know, the gentility, you know, the, the genteel society, you know, having their dance parties. You know, how genteel can you be when you enslave people? Like there's a certain absurdity to that. Um, and so it, it, it is this sort of circular narratives that I think happens again and again and again. Um, but within that repetition, you know, there is this sort of affixing certain truths because of repetition and the truths are based on fallacies. You know, so therein lies that we come full circle to this question around absurdity, you know, is that there are false facts that have somehow, you know, given this administration and all that's been happening, you know, you see the absurdity that's happening with the repetition of statements that happen over and over and over again. In some people's minds, that becomes affixed as fact. Mm -hmm. when everyone else understands it as pure fiction and the absurdity of that repetition over and over again. So, yeah, I just think it's very interesting, you know, and there, there, therein lies these sort of, um, these sort of presentations, the, the deviancy that comes out of it is how do we up the ante in the absurdity, you know, how do we take it a notch higher you know, in terms of uh, showing, and certainly there must have been spaces of deviancy, but it's not something that gets discussed. Um, I wanted to quickly just bring out this, um, the language in the question again of, can you talk more about how she does this without tipping over into voyeurism? And I wonder if, I guess, <sighs> It almost is positioned if voyeurism is a negative, like, or is not actually part of the work, or if it doesn't get kind of wrapped up in everything that Valerie and Hamza just talked about in terms of um, the absurdity and how we come to view um, and how we come to understand pleasure. And so I just wanted to, you know, briefly say a few, like, say something about this idea of voyeurism and. Um, and how it comes to mean something, well, how it, the definition is something negative, but then when associated with Kara Walker's work, um, it's an interesting tension that gets presented because as Hamza said, the those who are represented on the walls aren't aware of and aren't confronting the audience or the viewer. And that's how I think we come to understand their lack of power um, and agency and how we come to understand how we might, um, there might be some enjoyment or some um, kind of pleasure in viewing what we're actually seeing. And so I just, I think it's interesting that if we're gonna talk about voyeurism and Kara Walker's work, I think we have to talk about it as um, not something that she's trying to avoid, but something that um, becomes more of an issue and not to beat the dead horse that is spectatorship, but it becomes more an issue about audience. It becomes more an issue about reception and I think for um, for Walker, I'm I think she would be, um, and I think her work with Sugar Baby and the surveillance that she conducts around Sugar Baby um, kind of demonstrates a, an interest in an investment in um, exploring voyeurism, right? Uh, a kind of 
a voyeurism as a, a study of the work itself, but then a study of the work's reception. So I just, I think um, the work, the artist doesn't actually, I don't, I don't know that I believe the artist has as much to do as we think with this idea of voyeurism, right? That's how we show up to view the work. Um, so whether Walker's tipping into voyeurism, I think it's, are we tipping into voyeurism? Um, so just thinking about that a little bit. I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, it always has been how people approach the work. And again, those who look away and those who consume, you know, and those who are consuming, looking at those looking away and those looking away who are fixated on those who are consuming. And it, it is about that dynamic. And it is a, to me, an experiment. It is her great experiment, right? Uh, to see how far we've come as a society to deal with um, these, these vignettes, whether they're truthful or not. And as Hamza said, as you've reiterated, they're flat. This is, this is a constructed reality. And she shows you that it's a constructed reality. She cuts it out for you. She animates it for you. It is hermetically sealed. It, it is not something which you are engaging with. You're seeing it, but you are bringing to that site all of your perceptions, all of your experiences um, to determine whether you look or whether you turn away. And um, I think her desire is to provoke us to have these uncomfortable conversations. You know, sometimes we're having them together, but oftentimes we're not. There's a group over here having a conversation and there's a group over there having a conversation, but we're not confronting one another. Uh, and we're not because there is no safe place to have that, that dialogue. We haven't created for each other safe spaces to have the dialogue of what it has meant to have chattel slavery in this country. We have yet to discuss it. And it because of it, it becomes such a lingering, festering space that we, that, that work such as Kara's can really cast a bright light on the spaces where we are still, we are still seeping in terms of a wound, a gaping wound in this country. Um, well, there's a, another question that we have that deals with a subtlety as well, but it's a completely different aspect of the work. Um, the writer says, you mentioned her work in sculpture um, and specifically a subtlety. Can you talk about the work that was recently commissioned for Tate Modern, Fon's Americaness as well? It strikes me that both of these works were temporary and never meant to be permanent, question mark. They are or were monumental and yet impermanent. Curious what you make of this contrast. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really key, key characteristic of both those pieces. Um, the fact that that this that something as if I mean when we talk about a subtlety it doesn't exist anymore as if it were in a dream that we all collectively had in viewing this huge sugar man thing that's it's ridiculous and it's not even it's not in the space of a an animation right that this is being dreamt up but in the space in in our space right in the in the euclidean space of the here and now um but so with with this with the subtlety i think the idea of it being made of sugar a certain impermanence the, the ability for it to dissolve potentially right that all those metaphors are are are, are in it in it materially which is quite beautiful whereas i think with fons americanus the 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 issue to me was one of resolution. And I, and I totally agree, the issue of it not being permanent, but that they were very small um, objects that she had made, but then when they were blown up, that she still wanted to keep a certain kind of 
handcraft evident in the in the making and so the the you couldn't the the resolution on the figures they weren't tight they weren't tightly rendered anything so to me it wasn't the material which was like a some kind of uh, 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 substrate but it gave the impression of being like a a, a line, cross between limestone and a cement, a very high grade or high quality cement. But at the same time, like, was it cast? Was it carved? So how was the form generated would be one question around when you, when that I was asking as I looked at it. But then the lack of resolution on the characters, like it was very kind of still rough hewn in this, in this way. Like it was never meant to be fixed or it couldn't altogether settle in my imagination as a kind of image, right? Was the more powerful. So, so it's a very different kind of impermanence to me. It wasn't just that the material, the stone, the material gave the sense that it was meant to be, be permanent, unlike a subtlety, which is sugar, right? With, with this one, it was much, the impermanence resided more in the sketchy nature or in the execution. Right, but then to realize that that was wholly a choice on her part to have it, to want it, to still have that homemade look, right? So she was actually guiding them when they were making it and telling them when to stop, right? About how much like, like resolution she wanted to have with it. And I think it's very similar in part to the DIY nature of the films mm -hmm. that, that at certain points you would expect Kara to slip into a certain kind of like, I'm gonna say slickness in a way, but she always at a certain point seems resistant to that, right? Like wanting the hand to show, right? Or keeping the sketch like homemade, handmade nature of this thing, regardless of how big, to still have that be evident, which I think is really, you know, incredibly smart on, on, on her part, you know, as an artistic. Some but I love the, the temporal nature of these pieces. As you say, they sort of appear and then disappear like an aberration, you know? So uh, rather than this, um, it's confrontational in and of itself, you know? But it's, it's, it's something that you can't get so accustomed to that you begin to turn away from it, right? You don't, you can't ignore it. And that aberration has that kind of residual feel to it. Um, it's almost as, you know, palpable as the sort of tangible thing that's constantly in your psyche, right? I mean, she, it's like the earworm, right? For the, for the sight. And once you see it, you can never unsee it. You know, you don't have to be confronted with it every day. It doesn't have to be this permanent sculpture that you pass by because eventually it, it loses a certain kind of power when it's permanent. And it is something very powerful about having this very, very impactful experience that then disappears because then you start to search for it in different places. You, you start seeing it in spaces that you wouldn't ordinarily see it, right? Whereas before, like even the monuments that were here in Richmond for many years, eventually people just either didn't go by them or they ignored them. They just became uh, just it just receded into the landscape it didn't mean anything anymore and I think these sculptures are more powerful in their temporal nature yeah yeah, yeah. that just uh we can also and that sorry and Stephanie just to throw in one other work that we could throw into this would be the caravan or the calliope work that you know there's another instance of temporality of a work showing up for one moment having a performance that happens at this particular moment and then it disappears or moves on so sorry to interrupt but to no i just i wanted to agree and second what valerie was saying and it it echoes um some words i recently uh or a story that i recently watched again i think it was somewhere on tate's um i didn't have the privilege of getting to see it in person. So I watched a lot of things online about it, but Kara Walker was inspired by the Victorian Memorial in front of 
Buckingham Palace. And she's um, in the interview or in her reflection, she was talking about exactly what Valerie is, is discussing of how this monument, in fact, the larger they are, the more invisible they become in our, you know, experience of, it, you know, experiences of them. People in their millions walk by these sculptures um, or these structures um, in the course of a week and no one can probably tell you anything about them. In fact, she describes this, this process of forgetting Mm -hmm. um, the sculpture, even though she took pictures of it, you know, she was inspired and took some pictures and she said she forgot it immediately um, and didn't return to it, which I think is very interesting because I think I agree the power is in this temporal um, space that they occupy. Um, I will never forget a subtlety, you know, like ever. But I think it's interesting because the ways I remember it become very different. And through different senses, I then begin to access my experience of it. Like I said, I will never forget the way the warehouse smelled. Like that is in my brain forever. I'm starting to lose. And I think even though I look at images of it, you know, in, in teaching or regularly, um, I start to lose the orientation of the space a little bit because of the way the line was and the way the people were crowded. And I didn't get to be very close in certain ways because so many people were taking selfies. And so my experience, it becomes fuzzy. But I think in the same way that these pieces become this hyper visualized, a moment of hyper visualization um, in in opposition to the way Victoria Memorial becomes in completely invisible, even though it's so prominently displayed. And so I think that that in, in, of it, in and of itself is the most interesting, or it's one of the most interesting aspects of this because through that temporal presentation, we end up seeing it more clearly. Um, and as Valerie mentions, it will never leave, like it will never go away. We will never forget it. Um, so, I, and I, I too have the experience that, um, Kara describes where I've been to a thousand fountains, thousand mount, you know, monuments that I've, I've looked at over the course of travels. And I can't really make out, you know, anything distinct about any of them except for a subtlety. And I'm sure if I saw um, Fons Americanus, I probably would be thinking about that in the same, in a similar way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we have one last question and um, it starts off with, it's been an absolute pleasure to hear all your thoughts. And I agree that during the first panel and this one, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, this person is currently working on a feminist student exhibition in Miami University. And I've had the honor of working with Walker's 1998 African slash American piece. And selfishly, um, I wanted to know if you had thoughts on Walker's position in the feminist art canon and how she explores the intersectionality of gender and race. Mm -hmm. So one thing really quickly um, that I thought of when I read this question before we met was um, Brooklyn Museum, the Sackler Center has this work um, on their, on their website and they pair it with a feminist artist statement from Walker. And I'm sure this person, um, hopefully who's asking this question maybe has already found this and is familiar, but I just wanted to read this statement because I think maybe we can then talk about like, is this a feminist art statement? Like how does, how do we connect Kara Walker to feminisms? Um, but she says, quote, I find that I'm rewriting history, trying to make it resemble me, Kara, and me, Negress, but doing, it in little bits and pieces. It's a mono, monomaniacal undertaking, but there is a lot of white patriarchal damage to undo. I mean, that's the only way history is written anyway, in little pieces. I would have preferred to make up my own mythology and make it stick as effectively as those anti post bellum characters have in the collective unconscious, or to make up stories as influential as the American Revolution and its heroes and ideals. But alas, I've only got myself, the penny empire of me to work with, so that's what I do, end quote. Mm -hmm. So this was presented as a, a feminist art statement or feminist artist statement. So I just wanted to kind of throw that in the mix of this question. And I just wanted to say that this work really makes me think of Sandra Perry's work, Landscape of a Black Woman. Oh, no, no, Black Girl as a Landscape, I'm sorry. And that's from 2010 and it's another video work. Um, but I just, I also see um, 
yeah, I, it just resonates with me, um, those two works. And I think it's interesting how we chart Black female bodies um, in both the works and how that gets tied up with, or even, at least in this question, with kind of a feminist politic. Um, but then we have her statement. So I just wanted to, to leave that, not really an answer, but just more provocation. Well, you know, when and where Black women enter into the feminist discourse is a very interesting one. I mean, in so many ways, we were a part of a big contributor to uh, the feminist wave, and yet the issues that Black women placed forth were, were not addressed and, and were eventually, you know, dropped out of it. So it it's interesting to sort of come back and, and particularly to this moment where you know we have the black girl magic and you know or, or I love to say the black conjure woman moment because you know it's all about conjuring and this magic just doesn't come from nowhere you know so um that you know we're seen as the saviors of the day <laughs> you know we're, we're kind of back here but yet we're still grappling with um, the issues that the feminist movement did not resolve for black women. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of alignments that, you know, the big winners of all of these movements arguably were white women, you know, in terms of minority business initiatives and so on and so forth. So the sort of fixation of black women as uh, within the feminist discourse, I don't know if I would say the feminist discourse. I mean, clearly, I think Kara is speaking from, you know, spaces of, you know, being Black and being woman, not necessarily being woman and being Black. You know, there, there's a real, to me, that ordering is, is very distinctive for a reason, um, that, that there is um, a need to really contend with all of the issues that are thrust upon Black women and have been thrust upon Black women since the beginning that uh, we're still digging out from underneath, you know, uh, and the, multi the multiple layers of liberation that has to be undergone, you know. Um, but I think she's speaking more from a space of Blackness and the history of Black bodies in this country rather than um, just as female, though I could see in a lot of her vignettes how there is a very strong woman, womanist presence in the work. Yeah. Oh, sorry, just to follow up, I think it's interesting, Valerie, that this idea of Fem of woman and blackness. And I think the premise of black feminism or black feminist theory is that the very distinct standpoint of those intersections is what produces kind of a theoretical or a transformative um, moment in this case for history, right? So it's the, the, the location from which um, I write or I think or I make art as being the way through which we reimagine um, our collective history, our, you know, our position within the world or how we create change. And so I think that in this state, it's a black feminist statement in the sense that she's saying me, Kara Walker is the, the standpoint from which my narratives are derived or which my artwork has meaning. And I think just even claiming that space as black and as woman and as, you know, generating, you know, a, a life force, right, of meaning or the way we come to understand and learn critique history, I think is very, I don't know, I think it's very powerful, um, even if she's not thinking of it in that way. I guess I'm splicing words, but I think from the 70s, uh, women of color chose the word womanist, not right. feminist. No, and absolutely. It, yeah. Uh, and, and they did so to create that distinction, to say that the feminist movement did not speak for them. Um, but you're right, it, it, rather than situating it as feminist, I guess I'm arguing to situate it as Stephanie is, and we're in alignment, situation, situating it as a womanist statement, you know, um, that it is, and, and the characters uh, within the narratives, which are so 
in some way female centered um, to a degree, a woman always comes into play, uh, whether she is um, um, the one who initiates uh, or she becomes a sort of, um, I don't want to say an alter ego because I don't think it's an alter ego, though Caro comes, sometimes inserts herself into these narratives. Um, I don't really think of the characters or the female characters in her vignettes as alter egos. You know, Hamza, you may. Oh, Hamza totally disagrees with that. No, like, no, 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 no. I agree. I don't see. Uh, no, I don't see them at yeah. all. As alter egos. Yeah, no. I don't see them as alter egos. But I think it's oftentimes interesting how she introduces herself as the Negress. You know, almost to connect herself to the histories of Black women presence, Black female presence throughout this country, like she's connecting the present with the past. In other words, I'm connected to that person who in the 1700s you called a negress, you know, I mean, I'm the one in the same, we're cut from the same cloth. So yes, Carol Walker, yes, the negress, you know, I'm never going to let you forget you know, the history from which I emerge from in a way. So I think her characters are very interesting. Sometimes they're empowered, but they're empowered almost sometimes to their own peril. You know what I mean? Um, their empowerment sometimes get them, you know, mutilated or killed, or, you know, even if it's by their own kind, you know, uh, but there is agency that they find uh, in, in that. And I just wanted to quickly, I, that was not my concept. It was, I was borrowing heavily from Patricia Hill Collins on the, the connection between black feminism and the idea of standpoint. So I just want to make it very clear that that was not a Stephanie thing. That was a genius Patricia Hill Collins, black <laughs> feminism, so. <laughs> Got it. The, um, I, I mean, one of the things that I think that is, uh, uh, deeply feminine about Kara's work is the source of her, her, her narratives. So the Harlequin romance novel. So I think that that's, and then in turn to parody that form, right? As like to both, and, and I mean with, you know, to say cannibalism would almost be like an understatement to like devour it lock, stock and barrel and then to just like spit it back out, shit it back out, you know, um, like in, in its absurdist dimension, I, I think actually spells a certain, uh, uh, let's say a relationship to uh, what would be deemed feminine or very, very polite you know, in terms of like, oh, here's the, the box around what is known as, you know, a woman's genre that has a woman's readership around it, um, which, th and, and her ability to, uh, you know, parody it, lock, stock, and barrel, puts her in a position of power. So when I think about Kara, in some sense, I, it's, I think of her, simply is very, very powerful. Um, uh, I, 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 the, 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 the voice, the dynamic that she has in relationship to her subject matter, uh, her imagination, um, and uh, it's the, uh, which I think is very, very interesting to think of in terms of in relationship to, to, to feminism. You know, I feel as though, uh, you know, questions or a critique of power along those lines. Whereas I think of Kara's response to like, oh, a critique of power. It's like, oh no, 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 I want it, I want it, I want it. Like it's like, you know, like there's no, there's no hesitation there, and there's a, there's a level of confidence in terms of execution with her and drawing. So when I think about like, just like cannibalism would be an understatement. Self determination when it comes to Kara would also be an understatement. Wholly determined, like it's like. You know, to watch her draw and to watch her work, she can draw it, fat, think it, draw it, imagine it, draw it. I mean, she's in, in that um, uh, level of, 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 of creative confidence and power. I just find I'm in awe of it, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's say. But I think it, it does speak to 
um, and even things like scale at which she's working, right? Like, so how many, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, Richard, Sarah, yeah, Richard, Richard, you know, I'm going to do a huge sugar mammy sinks. Yeah, it's like, it's like, oh my God, you know, another kind of terror, you know, and it's very funny. I gave Richard Sarah a copy personally of her first catalog and watched Richard Sarah actually flip through the pages of it. Very, very beautiful. And he just said, wow, yeah, this is very powerful stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then he said to me, what, the, and what was the controversy again? <laughs> it was absolutely hysterical. Um, that's so yeah, but it, as far as like, a critique of, uh, um, uh, in some sense, you know, it may sound hacky, be the change you want to see, you know, and to think about Kara is like being, you know, occupying a seat of power as almost like, you know, I mean, role model, example, I mean, all those things fall short of what it is that I'm trying to articulate. Um, uh, but yeah, I think I, I, you know. I think it's interesting to think about those things in relationship to feminism. You know, what her position is in the world and how she got there, right? And her sense of self as an artist and a person. I almost want to propose Kara Walker as a bad feminist, um, in the same way that Roxane Gay kind of talks about a being a bad feminist, right? Exploring all the thing like exploring all the things that seem maybe even antithetic, like antithetical to feminist kind of progress. So I just want, I'm going to throw that out there too. I agree with everything that you just said, Hamza, but I think when, especially when it comes to being a role model or to being somebody who, um, and even in her subversion and, you know, consumption of the Harlequin romance novel, I think feminists would say that those novels are you know, completely yeah. unfeminist. Right, right? They're, they're horrible, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <about> women. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so yeah. I think that I, I like this, I am playing around with this idea of Kara Walker as a bad feminist, um, because I think that there's something um, that she's also doing that is, is, is actually antithetical to maybe for like feminist progress or ideal, like ideological purity. Yeah, but also role playing too, mm. right? So when she is Madam K.E.B. Walker, right? She fashions herself as Madam C.J. Walker, right? Which is also in part like, like it's both, it is a send up, you know, but I think of it as a loving one, you know, uh -huh. in a way. But I do like the idea of her as bad feminist more so than, which would almost fall along the lines of somebody like Louise Bourgeois. And I love, there's a great Rob Store essay, and I, I think it was for Parquet. And um, it's a great essay from Rob, but uh, he, he summed up, um, what was it? Uh, 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 what was it, name of the essays? Sister, uh, uh, bad mother, sister to some, bad mother to few, or something along those lines was the title of the Rob Store essay. But I think that he got a, as far as a portrait of her and a set of very complicated relationships about her, a relationship to other, other artists, but it's also as a power dynamic, right? Like Louise Bourgeois' role model or something. It's like, mm, I think we're looking at beyond good and evil here. <laughs> like, yeah. you know? And you know, in that, and how, you know, now we're in this, the third and fourth wave of feminism, you know, if we can still call it that. I mean, I just think there is a whole, there are whole generations of women who are now come to embrace feminism as a word, but to interrogate it and to, to really, to hold it in many ways accountable uh, to being really a, uh, a space for, for all women. I mean, when you think about, you know, I think it's really funny, um, Bill Burr, I don't know if you saw Saturday Night Live, it's been a, a few weeks ago now, but uh, he was saying how uh, white women had co-opted uh, aspects of the, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, just really just went in there and just co-opted it. Somehow, uh, what did he say? They 
they um, they uh, extended their Gucci heeled leg over the barrier and somehow started marching with the sisters. And he said, no, no, you white women, you're complicit. You need to sit over here with us white men and take your talking to. And it was like, you know, it's the like the Me Too movement <laughs> quickly, you know, uh, went from the author of this movement who was a woman of color suddenly to become this, this expanse of others, you know? And it should be a space for us all. It should be a generosity that we're offered to one another, but somehow it always gets co-opted. So, you know, there is an uneasy relationship, I think that black women have with feminism, understanding that our needs, our desires, our demands are always on the precipice of being co-opted and us being yet again eradicated, you know, from the discourse. So it's a bit uneasy, you know, it, it's, you know, and I think Roxane Gay is really beautiful in the sense that she represents this new sort of wave that embraces it, but also interrogates it. It's never going to let, you know, the first or second, you know, wave of feminism um, never let them forget that we were left out of the suffrage narrative. Black women were very much engaged in that narrative, and we were all but erased. It's only recently that it's come to the fore who these black suffragists were, you know. Um, same way with the feminist movement. We were there, we were visible, but yet we were left out of the conversation, you know, except for a prized few, you know. And so we're back again to this moment. And I think, you know, it has to be this space where we're constantly making room for one another, but also holding each other accountable. And I think by Kara constantly referring to herself as these other people or various um, iterations of herself, like she's carrying that past to keep it alive, right? To draw attention, to send up to it. But she's also, again, never letting people forget the sort of categories that they have created for Black women, right? And how we have transcended those categories. We could still interrogate them, but we keep them in the public imagination so they don't forget, <laughs> you know? So she's very, she's very sublime at that. And, and then there's this obvious point to make about her inserting herself in the work, which is what we talked about last time, you know, just being present, making herself known, and you see her, you see her in it. I mean, this is that you're only able to do that really with the videos, I guess, in a sense. Um, and, you know, what you were talking, you actually brought me back to that famous quote of Adrian Piper, you know, why is it when um, women and people of color start entering the art world, all of a sudden there's no longer a, a genius, that, that the, the death of the author, that comes when we start, you know, creating work. And here you have her in the work, making it, and you see that creative genius happening before your eyes with her, with her hands, and it's really powerful in that sense. Um, so uh, unless there's other thoughts, I don't want to cut anyone off. Um, if unless there is, I want to say thank you all so much. This has been another incredible session with your incredible, beautiful, generous minds. Um, I'm so happy we were able to uh, meet up again and have another thrilling discussion about Kara Walker's work. There's so much to get out of it that um, we had to come back and do it again. So, um, <laughs> So I'll say thank you to all our viewers um, and um, thank you to Valerie, Stephanie, and Hamza for taking the time to do this and we'll say goodbye. Thank and you. And thank you, Kanitra, for the invitation. Hamza, Stephanie, this has been amazing. So happy to have done this with you uh, and all the best on the exhibition. It's, it's amazing. So thank you. Thank you.